In this video, we'll review a prayer written by the Apostle Paul. It's taken from Colossians chapter 1. Now, I rarely miss my time of daily prayer, and the Apostle Paul made it a habit to pray for Christ followers often. Now, in my prayer time, I include scripture written by the Apostle Paul, which he intended as a covering for Christ's followers. I found it to be a very powerful prayer. It outlines how we're to grow in the Lord and the fruit we're to exhibit based on what Christ has done for us. Okay, so, you're born, you live, you die. And that living defines your eternity based on a decision you make in this life. Furthermore, life is unfulfilled if it's not brought into sync with God's purpose. But just what is, what is our purpose in life? What is God's will for our life? Let's see what insight the Apostle Paul gives us in answer to this question. Let's read Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 through 14. Again, the Apostle Paul. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The Apostle Paul has a great love for Jesus Christ, and as such, he also covers others with that same type of love. And Paul's great love for others is evident in all his prayers. Paul indicates that from the moment Christ's followers in Colossae put their trust in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, Paul was continually praying for them. The Apostle Paul was always front and center when it came to prayer and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, when it came to prayer and giving thanks to God, Paul was always consistent in teaching that this is God's will for all Christians, to pray and give thanks to God. And not just some of the time, but all the time. Paul was consistent in his teachings. His words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 says to rejoice always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And in, in Romans 12, 12, the Apostle Paul says the following, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. We're to be prayerful in each and every situation. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I believe that because of prayer, the Apostle Paul could follow up this scripture by stating in Philippians 4.11 that he had learned to be content in every situation. Then Paul says that through his prayer, he is asking for the Christians in Colossae to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Here's the scripture asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Notice that Paul didn't say partial knowledge of God's will, but a filling of the knowledge of God's will. And I believe Paul alludes to, alludes to the Holy Spirit when he speaks of being filled with a knowledge that gives us spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now speaking of the Holy Spirit, let's look at this third person of the Trinity. He's fully God, 
is personal and is co-equal and co-eternal with the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, and the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. What are some of the job duties of the Holy Spirit? Well, he gives us information. He gives us wisdom, understanding, and spiritual discernment. When Paul prays for Christians to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, I believe he's praying for the Holy Spirit's fullness in the life of Christians so they may gain a correct knowledge of God. Now Christ gives us insight into the prompting and working of the Holy Spirit whom Christ refers to as the Helper. In John chapter 16, Jesus says, When the Helper comes, he will show the people of the world how wrong they are about sin, about being right with God, and about judgment. He will prove that they are guilty of sin because they don't believe in me. He will show them how wrong they are about how to be right with God. The Helper will do this because I'm going to the Father. You will not see me then. And he will show them how wrong their judgment is because their leader has already been condemned. I have so much more to tell you, but it's too much for you to accept now. But when the Spirit of Truth comes, he will lead you into all truth. He will not speak his own words. He will speak only what he hears and will tell you what will happen in the future. So, we can glean a couple of things from the words of Jesus regarding the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. Notice Jesus says the world will be convicted of sin. So Jesus is telling us that each person has an understanding of sin because the Holy Spirit causes them to, causes them to know they are sinful. Now secondly, the Holy Spirit will let others know about the righteousness of God. Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will convict others about their need to be right with God. And thirdly, Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit will let people know that there will be a judgment. In other words, there will be a time of reckoning before God. Then Jesus tells us there will be proof provided to all people regarding their guilt that they are guilty of sin because they didn't believe in the Son of God as the Messiah. Those who, who don't accept the Son of God cannot be made right with God. They can't be redeemed if they don't acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. Jesus then makes an interesting statement. He tells us there are those who don't understand what is needed to be made right with God. But if they listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit who convicts them, he will show them what is needed to be made righteous. And what is needed can only be obtained through faith by believing in the Son of God. This is the only way someone can be made right with God, perfect before God, and holy even as God is holy. These are the traits of Christ, Christ which are credited to those who believe in him. Now the statement made by Jesus he will show them how wrong they are about how to be right with God, is likely directed toward many of the Jewish ruling religious leaders. They believe they had the answer, an answer that is primarily based on the law of Moses. But Jesus is saying they're wrong. Relying on the law will not make them right with God. If they don't believe in Jesus as a Messiah, as a Christ, then their belief is futile and they will not be made righteous before Father God. Then Jesus makes a rather strong statement about the Holy Spirit revealing any wrong thinking regarding deliverance from judgment. And if someone continues in this wrong thinking, then their leader or their master is Satan, whom Jesus says has already been condemned. And remember, a key message of the gospel is that deliverance from judgment cannot be obtained through the law. Deliverance can only be attained, obtained through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Next, Jesus tells his, his disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this will occur shortly after he returns to his Father. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, he will be the Spirit of truth that will lead them into all truth. Not partial truth, but all truth. 
Finally, we see that just as Jesus only spoke and did what his Father commanded, so too will the Holy Spirit only speak the words that are given to him based on what he hears from Father God and from God the Son. The Holy Spirit will give insight to Christ's followers based on the insight he receives from the Father and the Son. The Apostle Peter states this in 2 Peter chapter 1. Most important of all, you must understand this. No prophecy in the scriptures came from the prophet's own understanding. No prophecy ever came from what some person wanted to say, but people were led by the Holy Spirit and spoke words from God. So, a true prophet can only have a true understanding of God's words from the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, one other thing that is very important to understand is that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a deposit at the time of salvation. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 tells us, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until our redemption until our redemption. So just as the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, gives us wisdom and knowledge of God, and gives us truth through prophecy, so too is the Holy Spirit given to us as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance as children of God until Christ's followers are ushered into the heavenly kingdom. Now the Holy Spirit empowers us when we need an extra boost. The words used in scripture is filled with the Holy Spirit so that we may accomplish what's needed. This is a reference to a need to perform powerful actions or deeds for God. This term is noteworthy throughout scripture in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when the Apostle Paul prays that Christ's followers be filled with knowledge and understanding, he's asking for the Holy Spirit to fill Christians and empower Christians so they can perform God's will for their lives. As Paul prays for the Holy Spirit guidance and direction for Christ's followers, he follows up with, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And just what is a manner that's worthy of the Lord? Paul is saying that as a result of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we can know God's will for our lives we can then walk in the path God has purpose for us, His will. Now what's the result of walking in God's will? Paul says that we can then be fully pleasing to God. And how do we know that we're we're pleasing to God? Well, Paul subsequently gives us the answer to this question. First of all, we'll be bearing fruit in every good work. Remember what Jesus said about him being the vine and we're the branches? Listen to his words from John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus tells us that we can only bear this fruit, of which Paul speaks, by remaining in him in the same way a branch is in the vine, attached to the vine. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Now, the second reason Paul says that we can know that we're pleasing to God is that we continually increase in our knowledge of God. And this is not just a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge as well. Paul says, Paul says the following in the first chapter of Ephesians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. 
Then Paul says that, that for us to bear the good fruit and to increase in the, in the knowledge of God, we need a power source. Now there are a number of scriptures which attest to this needed power source. I'll mention a few. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In Romans 15.13, Paul speaks to the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Also, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have endurance and patience as he enables us to do good works and increase in the knowledge of God. Now, the one thing the, the Apostle Paul states consistent, consistently is that we're always to be thankful as we lift our prayers to God. Paul mentioned the following in his letter to the Philippians. And notice that this is very similar to our scripture reading from Colossians, which tells us to give joyful thanks to the Father. Philippians 1, 3 through 6 says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, in our giving joyful thanks to the Father, Paul specifically mentions to the Colossians that Christ's followers have been qualified by Father God as saints to inherit the kingdom of God. Then Paul says that we've been delivered from darkness into light. Through our faith and belief in the Son of God, we've been redeemed and our sins have been forgiven. You know, Scripture is a foundation of our praying. And the key to unlocking scripture is a contemplation and reflection of what we've read. How do we do this? First of all, we need to start by using the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray for, for Holy Spirit insight. Then we need to bring into focus the content of the scripture. Next, we need to gain an understanding of the scripture. Then we memorize scripture. Next, we promote a worship, worship of God through scripture. And finally, we apply the scripture to our daily living. And remember, the starting place is to call on the Holy Spirit to empower us. And we do this through prayer. Now, our closing prayer will be our scripture reading for today. It's the words of the Apostle Paul to not only the Colossians, but to all Christ followers. And so, from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the lord fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Father God, I pray this in the name of your Son, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching.